I welcome you to our continuing study on the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon ever preached. And today we're going to be looking at Matthew 5, verses 17 to 26. Jesus had just finished talking uh, to his disciples about their new identity as they come under the rule of heaven, the blessed ones, that, that God doesn't belong to just the religious elite and the wealthy and the powerful, but to the poor in spirit and the meek and those who look power, powerless in the world. But rather, they've come under the rule of heaven. They're blessed, and, and, and their identity is now as change makers. They're salt and light in the world. That's, that's where he's been so far. And now, immediately, he, he addresses the number one question, probably in the minds of these Jewish disciples. Uh, well, if this new order, and we're coming under the rule of heaven, and you're changing all the rules here, uh, and turning the paradigms upside down, where the least favored are the most blessed, um, well, what do we do with the law of God in the Old Testament? And so Jesus anticipates that question and says, do not think that I've come to abolish the law. So in everything I'm saying here, don't come to the wrong conclusion. I've not come to abolish the law or the prophets. Now the law and the prophets would have been the Jewish way of, of saying what we would refer to as the Old Testament. And uh, he said, I, I've not come to do that, but I have, I've not come to abolish them, but I've come to fulfill them. Very important word. It, fulfill means to bring to the intended, intended end or the intended purpose. I've come to fulfill everything that the Old Testament was pointing to. So I've not come to take away the law, but I've come to fulfill them. And then uh, three verses later, after unpacking that a little more, he says, For I tell you, in verse 20, that unless your righteousness... Now, how's the law affecting your, your life? What's your life? What's the condition of your heart? Unless your righteousness surpasses... Here's the tough word. Actually surpasses that of the Pharisees and, and the teachers of the law. You will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. This new rule of heaven that you're coming under in, in me... He says, you're going to miss it unless you have a righteousness that's greater than the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And this would have been stunning for Jesus' audience to hear because nobody was better at rule keeping than the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. They not only had the laws of the Old Testament, but they had human laws they added. So we wouldn't even come close to disobeying the law of God in the Old Testament. And Jesus now is saying, no, no, in this new order, your righteousness need to actually surpass the righteousness of those Pharisees and the teachers of the law. In essence, what Jesus will be saying here is that keeping the rules does not necessarily make you righteous. It's the Christ-likeness inside. It's the Christ-like. It's what's happening in your heart. And he's going to take six different situations, as we'll be seeing, to uh, illustrate that. But let's just for a moment jump to the very end of this whole section, the last verse of Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus will end this whole section on greater righteousness by paraphrasing and saying the same thing but in different words. And, and this feels really self-defeating at first. Be perfect. Be perfect. As, just like, that's that likeness, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And Jesus is going to be saying, keeping the world's rules isn't enough. There's got to be a Christ-likeness. There's just a like-godness deep in our hearts. But, but that word, perfect, I mean, um, or, or can be translated complete. I mean, just be walking in the full purposes and full obedience to God. Just as your Heavenly Father is perfect. I like how C.S. Lewis resolves that for us in his British way. He says, the command, be ye perfect, is not idealistic gas, or we would say today, it's not blowing smoke. Nor is it a command to do the impossible, as, it, as impossible as that feels to be perfect, or to have this righteousness that's greater than even the most supposedly religious people we know. No, he is going, this is the key to it, God is going to make us into creatures that can obey that command to be perfect. So it's that recreation within us. This is what Paul unpacks for us in Romans chapter 8, uh, verse 3, where he will say, for what the law 
was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. So, so Jesus would come to do something for us that we cannot do. Because look at the beginning of that verse again. Law and powerless always go together. The law of God is good. I mean, the Ten Commandments, that's part of God's law. But, but the problem with just having rules is the rules don't bring the power to obey those rules with them. This is why we needed somebody to come, just like us, in the likeness of flesh and be a sin offering. And to, on himself on the cross, take our sinful nature. And so he, in the process, condemned sin in the flesh. You see, the law is powerless because it's weakened by our fleshly nature, our sinful nature. And so he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So by new life in the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit creating Christ-likeness inside of us, the law might be fully met. Remember Jesus said, I have come not to do away with the law, but to fulfill it, to bring it to its intended end. And that is that we would be righteous because Jesus has made us righteous from the inside out. So now Jesus is going to deal with six areas of our lives in which he will make his case that just keeping rules doesn't necessarily make us righteous. It's Christ's likeness inside of us. He's going to talk, we'll, we'll look in our next lesson about, about sexual attraction, divorce and remarriage, all these things. But he'll start with anger and murder. Anger and murder. And he starts this way, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago. And then he's going to quote one of the Ten Commandments. You shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. Even in our society today, if you murder somebody, you're going to be arrested and thrown in jail, maybe even uh, subject to the death penalty. So there's judgment. There's consequences to murdering people. And and same in God's economy. Uh, don't murder. But what's that exceeding righteousness? What's that Christ-like internal righteousness looks like? Well, he, he goes on to say, I tell you, that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will also be subject to judgment. Now, there's a good kind of anger when we're really angry at evil, when we're angry at injustice and abuse. But in this context, God's, Jesus is talking about those kinds of attitudes in our heart that bring judgment. And so he's talking about the kind of anger that makes us hate and despise people. He said, okay, you know, and sometimes people would joke, well, at least I didn't kill him. He said, okay, you didn't kill him, but you still hate him and despise him. Is that the righteousness of Christ? Or he goes on to say, again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, raka. Now, in the Aramaic, this is a semi-swear word. It's part profanity. And and, and it's, it's not just being angry at a person, it's just holding them in contempt. It's just despising them and refusing to see anything good about them. And uh, pardon, pardon my demonstration of this, I apologize up front, but some scholars think Raqqa had its original root in that ha ah, sound of gathering spittle in your throat for the purpose of spitting at uh, somebody and totally demeaning them. But Jesus isn't quite done. Uh, he says, and anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Now, calling someone a fool doesn't seem that bad to most of us, but, but to the Jew who would understand what the Proverbs taught in the Old Testament about a fool, a fool was lazy, a fool was stupid, a fool was immoral, a fool was rebellious against God, and a fool was constantly indulging in self-destructive behaviors. I mean, this guy, the fool, was the ultimate loser. And, and to say, you fool, you fool, was like the ultimate insult against a person. We don't quite have, we don't quite have a parallel in our contemporary culture to you fool. Probably the closest would be outright profanity. It'd be when I would say, you blankety blank blank. Um, 
it, it's, it, it's this attitude in our hearts that totally despises and demeans other human beings. Now, it's true, you're keeping the Ten Commandments. You're not killing them. But Jesus says the greater righteousness will point to the Christ-likeness in your heart. And um, angry, raka, fool, I mean, these may be increasing intensity. We're not sure. All we know is that they all have one thing in common, and that's judgment. Don't be angry with a brother or sister, and you'll be su or you'll be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, raka, is answerable to the court. That's another way of saying you're subject to judgment. And anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. That's judgment. And so he's saying, okay, so you didn't murder somebody, so you didn't kill them, but you felt like it. And you're not transformed on the inside in terms of your attitudes towards other people that God created in his image. And uh, so that's not the greater righteousness. And then he's going to flip the coin on us and say it's one thing not to hate and despise people. There's another thing to look at the degree to which we actually want to reconcile with people. So he goes there next. And he picks one of the holiest moments in a religious person's worship life. He said, therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, so you've made maybe a three-day pilgrimage to Jerusalem, you're in the temple, you're offering your gift at the altar, and there you remember that there's somebody back home that it's not even that you have something against them, but they have something against you. So you're, you're, you're at the altar of God, you're in God's presence, and you realize somebody has something against you. What does he say? Uh, finish up, God first, keep worshiping, and then go make it right. No. He says, what a word, leave. He says, leave. Sure, it's a three-day journey back home, but go back be finished, before you finish your worship and be reconciled. That's the word, be reconciled. How much do we want to be reconciled? Do we want to be reconciled to people that much and then come and offer your gift? Now, this is not some kind of legalistic thing. It's not really a law. It's just an illustration that points to what's really in our hearts. Do we really want to reconcile? I mean, you may try to reconcile and they're still holding something against you. Does that mean you can never go back to church again and worship now? It, it's just an illustration that puts the focus on what's happening in our hearts. And then, and then he brings us a situation of somebody suing us in court. And he said, you know, it's good to reconcile here too. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together, while you're still with that person, and while you're, while you're on the way with them. Or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you'll be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. That's a metaphor for judgment. And, uh, you, you know, while we're still together, while we're still on the way, while we're maybe still talking to each other, can you find it in your heart to be kind? Are you willing to meet that person part way and reconcile? Um, and even though you may feel like you're right and, and they're all wrong, do you care enough about them to at least try to understand the grievance from their point of view? So we have this in here. Although another way of looking at this, is, and, and all roads lead to the same place, is that Jesus is really using this lawsuit issue as a metaphor for what he's talking about earlier, and that's avoiding judgment. You know, he's saying it's kind of like Jesus' altar call. While you can, get your hearts right, get your heart right. He said you're going to be subject to judgment if you hate and despise people. But while you have the chance, get your heart right with God. While you have your chance, Let's forgive one another and get our hearts right with each other while we have the chance so that we can avoid judgment. In, in summary, um, you could say this. It's one thing not to murder, but it's another thing entirely to love people. That's the greatest righteousness. And so we come back to Paul in Romans, this time chapter 13, verse 8. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has, and there's that word again that Jesus used, has fulfilled 
the law. May God help you.